A 59-story skyscraper was built back in 1977 in Manhattan using a pretty unique style of architecture. And less than a year after the building was finished being built, the engineer team behind this brand new skyscraper had a horrifying discovery. The lawyer was there with me and we told him, you know, our building's going to fall down if we don't fix it. But don't worry, Hugh, we're going to fix it. What they realized is that there was a major oversight in the engineering and that if a strong enough gust of wind came ripping through Manhattan, this tower would literally be toppled to the ground. And as you guys can see in this footage, it doesn't take an engineer to know that something looks a bit sketchy and off here with a building only having four oddly placed stilts at the base. When everybody figured out exactly how at risk this skyscraper was of literally falling over in a storm, it threw the developer, the architect, the engineer, and the city into a panic until they figured out a fix. Because if the tower did fall down, it would have impacted thousands of lives and put other surrounding buildings at risk of collapse as well. And since this this was July, it could fall down the summer of 1978 because the hurricanes are what going to be what does it. This story goes down as one of the biggest engineering mishaps of all time. In fact, it was such a mishap that it was kept secret for 20 years until a journalist overheard the story at a dinner party. Today, let's talk about the 59 story crisis, one of the wildest stories in real estate development history. The subject of today's video is located at 601 Lexington Avenue. It was formerly known as the Citigroup Center and it's no doubt one of the more unique buildings in Manhattan's skyline partially due to the 45 degree angled rooftop, which that rooftop was done originally for solar benefits, but also to break up the monotony of the flat roofed buildings in New York. But what makes 601 Lexington even more unique and unusual is the four stilts that support the tower, which these legs are massive. They're each about 112 feet high. While a tower standing on stilts is odd enough, you can see in these clips that the stilts are actually placed in the center of the tower's edges instead instead of the corners of the skyscraper, as you might expect. There's an interesting story as to why 601 Lexington was built this way. To give you guys a visual, I set up some blocks. Let's go check them out. So see first, this is how most skyscrapers look from the base. They're just perfectly square and sitting on a foundation. If you were going to put a skyscraper on stilts though, the first thought would be to put the stilts in the four corners like this. It just feels way more natural and stronger. But 601 Lexington was built like this, with the stilts in the center of each section instead of in the corners. It turns out that the developer spent about five years assembling all of the land that he needed in order to build this skyscraper. But in the northwest corner of that land was a church called St. Peter's Lutheran Church. Well, this church ended up agreeing to let the developer build the Citigroup Center, but the only condition is that they wanted him to build them a brand new church in the exact same location of the old church on the site. This posed a a bit of a problem because the old church sat right in the corner of where the new Citigroup Center was supposed to go, which explains why the architect needed to come up with a unique design to build a skyscraper around the church. One of the most respected structural engineers at the time, William LeMessure, was brought on to help with coming up with the engineering plan here. And William ended up deciding that these four stilts were a fine way to hold up 601 Lexington. The end result was a 59 story skyscraper, one that stood on four 112 foot stilts. It has 1.6 million square feet of space inside. It weighs in total about 25,000 tons and it costs about $175 million to complete. Now, one of the single biggest engineering considerations when you're building a skyscraper is exactly how strong winds will impact the structure. For one, you want the occupants inside the building to be comfortable. You don't want the building swaying around like crazy in the wind and making people sick. And for two, obviously you don't want a strong enough wind to come through and knock your building down in the event of an intense storm. Well, 601 Lexington was designed, engineered, and built, and everybody thought that everything was fine. This was until William LeMessure got a call from a Princeton student named Diane Hartley, who stated that she and her professor discovered something scary about the engineering calculations at 601 Lexington. To put it super simply, what Diane discovered was that the structure was 
was not built in a way that could withstand a strong gust of wind that came in at it diagonally, which if this happened would almost certainly cause the skyscraper to fall to the ground. Obviously, this totally freaked LeMessure out, and at first he actually dismissed the student and said that she and her professor just didn't know what they were talking about. But LeMessure also admitted that this call did get into his head, and so he went on to do some calculations of his own, and what he discovered in those calculations was horrifying. The support system that LeMessure originally designed called for welds to basically hold the building structure together, but the developer later opted to use bolts instead of welds to save money. And this simple variation, using bolts to hold the structure together instead of using welds, made a huge difference in the structural integrity. Armed with this heavy realization, William flew out to his lake house on Sabago Lake in Maine with his wife to do a bunch of calculations and figure out how structurally sound the building really was. And sure enough, William LeMessure confirmed that in its current condition, it was very realistic for winds to knock down 601 Lexington. In fact, a storm strong enough to do this would hit New York City once every 16 years. Here I am, the only man in the world, the only person in the world who knew this. Yikes. He ended up taking immediate ownership of the situation. He came up with a fix for the problem, which was to basically get to the structural members of the tower, weld some steel plates to the joints, and then patch everything back up. I want to take a second to appreciate what LeMessure did here, because by basically blowing the whistle on himself, he now was putting himself at risk of litigation, a possible bankruptcy, and an almost guaranteed devastation to his reputation. Once the fix was outlined, William contacted the architect to make them aware of the dilemma. Then he called the insurance company to talk about whether the expense would be covered by insurance. But the insurance company said, we can't wait. We got to do something, don't we? You have to do something, the measure. After that, he met with the building owner to break the news to them. And he said, how much is it going to cost? I don't think it's going to cost an awful lot. A million or two? Uh, that's nothing. We're building the cost 175 million and if it falls down <laughs> he of course needed to make the city aware that some emergency repairs would be needed at the tower and he got in touch with the bank as well to discuss options for financing the repairs what's crazy is that part of William's plan here was to also notify the press he just felt like the public needed to know and he wanted to be in control of telling that story but literally the evening that he sat down to call the New York Times he got a pre-recorded message that said that the media Media had gone on strike. Not only did the New York Times go on strike, but all the newspapers in New York went on strike until October. <laughs> <clears throat> so we had a press blackout, and that was the greatest thing that ever happened. What are the odds? At the end of the day, this entire remediation operation was kept a secret. Only a handful of people were made aware of what was happening and what needed to be done to correct the problem. The scariest part of this story comes next because this all went down in June of 1978, which meant that it was hurricane season in New York. And a big storm named Hurricane Ella, the strongest hurricane on record, was literally headed straight for the city. With everybody on board, including NYPD and the Red Cross in case anything went wrong, they got started on the repairs at 601 Lexington. These repairs began in August of 1978. The hurricane did come in September, but it ended up not coming through the city after all. And by October of 1978, the repairs were 100% finished. They were able to do all of this remediation work either at night or on the weekends. And based on the way that the skyscraper was originally built, it was pretty easy for them to complete this job without anybody who actually worked in the office tower ever finding out what was actually happening. It was an expensive job, much more than LeMessure originally anticipated. Most reports say that the contractor bill was around four million bucks, but LeMessure never came out of pocket on the deal. His insurance company actually coughed up two million dollars to pay for the repairs, and after that the case was dismissed and no further litigation was pursued. LeMessure of course expected the insurance company to raise his premiums after this, but surprisingly his premiums were actually lowered. The insurance company said that his honest actions enhanced his reputation and 
that he deserved a break. From 1978, when this all went down, all the way through 1995, this entire story was kept a secret. It only went public in 1995 when a journalist reported it to the New Yorker at a dinner party. Shortly after, the 59 Story Crisis was published, and a few months later, William LeMessure went on to share the story in great detail with a class at MIT. And by the way, that's the speech where all those clips of William from today's video came from. After the repair, 601 Lexington is now strong enough to withstand a 700 year storm. In fact, I read that it's one of the safest structures now to have ever been built. In 2016, the building was the youngest New York building to be named as a landmark and Citicorp is no longer occupying the skyscraper. It is still office space though, with the largest tenant being Blackstone who occupies about 326,000 square feet of space. This story nowadays is looked at as a story of ethics, both for the responsibility that William will measure took and the speed in which he took action. An architect's dream may in fact be an engineer's nightmare, but in the case of the Citicorp Center, the engineer still ended up coming out on top. I'll see you guys next time.